ready to keep you company wherever you are. Card Blanche, the podcast, brings you immersive, hard-hitting stories anytime, anywhere, every week. Welcome to another installment of the Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche. This week, we have Queen and Maswabi in the hot seat to help us make sense of the latest news developments. Here's what's coming your way. Daily Maverick has shut down. Well, sort of. Why all South Africans should pay attention. It's the battle of public protectors, but at what cost? Then the ANC is confident it will reign victorious come the May elections. I don't think anyone can be a politician without being slightly delusional. But definitely I think the ANC is using its legacy and the 30 years of democracy tagline to make sure that they attract voters. And a win for Sia Khaleesi, Limpopo musicians and South Africa as a whole. But first, we try and understand why so many people are convinced that the late former Steinhoff CEO, Marcus Eurster, is faking his own death. Queenan, welcome back to the show. It's always great having you. How have you been? Hi, Levan. I've been good. Just a bit busy because of election season, but we'll get through it just about a month or so and then everything will be done and dusted. We'll chat a bit about elections later on in today's show. But first, I want to get into the story that everyone's kind of buzzing about online. The late former Steinhoff CEO died by suicide in March. And since then, many people have gone down a really strange rabbit hole. Why do you think some people are just not able to accept that your stay is dead? I honestly think it's because of maybe the way in which the matter has been reported ever since mm. his uh, apparent suicide. And I'm going to criticize <laughs> my fellow colleagues in the industry, but I don't think that we followed up as much as we needed to on this issue because after we knew about the suicide, when the media got to the scene, They were told that he was rushed to hospital. So no one really saw him or a body at the scene. Maybe there are eyewitnesses. But as far as the media coverage goes, they never really saw any kind of bodies. Was there a memorial service? Was there a funeral? I haven't seen anything in the media. And of course, most families would want to do everything in private under the circumstances. But I do still think that we could have done more for coverage. Rebecca Davis did a fact check to separate fact from fiction. And she says that a lack of transparency in the investigation following his death, as well as his funeral, as you've just said, created a perfect environment for conspiracy theories to really flourish. And of course, there's the Facebook rapist. I think that a lot of people are also referring to the whole Tabor Besta case. It's easy to see how seeds of doubt can really take root. For sure. I think the Tabor Besta case is a very good case study on how things can be hidden and how the law can be escaped. So yes, you are right. It gives a lot of ground for people to question whether Marcus Yester indeed has passed away. On Monday, the 15th of April, several South Africans woke up to the alarming headline, Daily Maverick has shut down. While the shutdown only lasted for 24 hours, the impact was felt by many South Africans. The response was varied, ranging from concern and strong support to celebration and snide remarks. Regardless of how you feel about the DM shutdown, one thing is clear. More needs to be done to protect independent media. Let's get into the Daily Maverick shutdown that happened last week, Monday. It was lauded by media houses and journalists, while it also drew the ire of many online users who labeled the shutdown a stunt and in some cases said Daily Maverick should just remain shut down for good. Clearly, it was a very divisive campaign, but a very important one. Lizanne, we are in an election year, as everyone knows, and newsrooms have to pull together as many resources to make sure that we're able to report on what is happening with political parties, make sure that citizens know their options. And that costs some money. And I think this campaign is very important because it highlights the importance of media freedom and independent media. And I think this was just raising awareness of 
the state of newsrooms financially and otherwise that we are running thin as newsrooms in South Africa. And without us, without our voice as the media, South Africa could go into obscurity as a democracy. It's very important for countries like South Africa with our budding democracy. And admittedly, I felt like I almost lost a limb on Monday, unable to access my morning Daily Maverick fix. And I think that's also the point of it, right? To show people that just one day without independent media can leave us running blind, essentially. And I think that brought home that idea very strongly. But I want to know from you, do you think it will encourage South Africans to pay more attention to matters relating to media freedom and be more aware of moments when media freedom does come under attack? When we were speaking about it prior to actually carrying out the plan, the conversation was around how we as media houses are first to report on stories about other people, other industries, but we barely do the same for our own industry, which also needs coverage of some sort and also needs us to speak out about our issues and dilemmas. So I do believe that there are some people who believe that they need to support media in any way they can, financially and otherwise. And in the same breath, listen, I just wanted to go back and explain to our listeners exactly what dilemma we've been under in the media industry industry and it's issues like failing to generate revenue and just generally the media houses have had to retrench so many people over the years and unfortunately I was a casualty I was 25 at the time in the article written by Daily Maverick they do mention Huffington Post South Africa yes. where we were retrenched I was there and it was kind of my first permanent job as a news reporter and it was an extremely hard time I was young I didn't understand why to be in the situation and you can see how newsrooms are shrinking over time newsrooms usually used to have like a politics team a news team a sports Mm. team all of that is kind of narrowing down and sadly it affects the industry also the fact that because of the lack of funding it sometimes means that newsrooms cannot afford the most experienced journalists to come in and kind of groom us who are coming up and to actually do the heavy lifting. And you you see Mm -hmm. the juniorization of newsrooms to a large extent. So it's it's been a, a very sad story for the media industry here in South Africa and around the world. A furious court battle between a former and current public protector played itself out in the High Court last week, as the ousted Busisiwe Mkwebane demanded she be paid a multi-million rand gratuity owed to her by the Chapter 9 institution. Ultimately, the Pretoria High Court found there wasn't anything urgent about Mkwebane's application, and the case was removed from the role. However, the case has brought to light just how voraciously she spent the vital institution's money. On to our former public protector, Busisiwe Mkwebane. Late last week, current public protector, Koleka Kaleka, detailed in an affidavit submitted to the High Court just how much money her predecessor spent in what Kaleka labeled, quote, a reckless abuse of taxpayers' money. Now, she further stated that Mkwebane left the public protector office, quote, in financial dire straits and The figures given in the affidavit were astronomical. I mean, there was 147 million rand spent just on defending several flawed reports alone. But my question is, following all of this, can the Chapter 9 institution recover? Because really, if you look at it and if you listen to the people currently in office, it's been stripped bare and it's really a shell of what it used to be. So I'm wondering, can it really recover? Listen, I do think there can be some kind of recovery. I do believe that the turmoil in the Chapter 9 institution was unnecessary and it was actually the main reason why so much money was spent. I do believe that at this point it's important for institutions like the Public Protector's Office to exist and be active in our budding democracy because that is what makes South Africa so unique. It makes South Africa trustworthy, not only internally, but all over the world. When you look at a nation like South Africa and you see the institutions that have been built 
and that have succeeded over the last 30 years, you realize that we need this for Mm. our legitimacy. And not only that, we need that to assure South Africans that there are institutions to make sure that officials and top executives are held accountable. By now, several polls have painted a picture of an ANC potentially losing power, with political newbies such as the MK Party and Rise Mzanzi eating away at the ruling party's supporter base. But if Queenan's recent conversation with ANC insiders is anything to go by, the ANC is surprisingly confident about its chances of a solid victory at this year's general elections. So let's talk elections. And I want to focus specifically on the ANC this week. You spoke to party treasurer general Gwen Ramokopa last week about how confident the party is about retaining its position as the ruling party. Firstly, tell us a bit, what did she tell you? She made some really interesting comments. So the ANC is looking to get 57.5% support as they did in the 2019 elections. They do not want to slip beneath that percentage, which means with the estimated 70% voter turnout, the party will have to get at least between 10 and 11, I would say 11 million from my calculation, from the 27 million that has registered to vote. So that is the kind of hill they'll have to climb come May 29th. And what's interesting, obviously, is that the ANC is looking to accelerate its election campaign, which means that As we move closer to elections, they are going to be targeting metro areas. They're going to be targeting provinces where they believe it's their stronghold to make sure that their existing base comes back and votes for the ANC yet again. The ANC is going full force in KZN, and they also want to make sure that in Gauteng, they're able to turn the tide because we do know that they had 50% in 2019, which means that If they do drop, then we'll have to get into a coalition. So those are the kind of issues that they are avoiding right now as a political party. They do not want coalitions. They want an outright majority. And a conversation about coalitions is not important right now because that is not what they are aiming towards. For me, the ANC seems very optimistic, despite the various polls indicating it could lose a large chunk of its votes, if not lose majority. So I'm wondering, is the party in denial, perhaps, or does it know something we don't know? What what could you gauge from your interactions with them? I think it's a little bit of both. I don't think anyone can be a politician without being slightly delusional. But definitely, I think the ANC is using its legacy and the 30 years of democracy tagline to make sure that they attract voters. I do think that the ANC will not drop under 50% nationally. But I do think, yes, KZN, Gauteng, they are in trouble And definitely because of the emergence of the MK party, which is led by former President Jacob Zuma, I do believe that in KZN, they will have a very tough time. Also because the IFP, if you look at the election trends, in the last couple of elections has kind of been able to stop their decline. And that's something that the ANC definitely needs to be worried about because it did impact them in 2021 at the local elections. So in Gauteng, I do believe the emergence of new political parties like Action SA, Arise and Zansi, they could also play a big role in the ANC's decline. And Action SA, for instance, in the city of Joburg, overtook the EFF as being the third largest party. So yes. they really had an impact where results were concerned. So they are a party to look out for in Gauteng. And that could be the ANC's problem there. And we've also seen the party hammer on its many successes over the last 30 years. And this seems to underpin their election strategy in a big way. But they also say that they plan to target first-time voters, something you also highlighted in your article. But frankly, I don't see the youth buying into the ANC's dream. Yeah, so basically that is one of the core strategies to make sure that young people go out and connect with the ANC in some way during the campaign. And also that on May 29th, this translates into votes. I don't know if the ANC will be able to pull this off, but I could say maybe the fact that they go into these elections with a youth league could mean that some youth could 
connect with them this time around. I mean, in 2021, they went in without young people. There was no youth league. There hadn't been a youth league for around eight years in the ANC. Mm. So I don't know how important their role could be in turning the tide when it comes to young people and young voters. So the ANC is also trying to draw in their former leaders, David Mabuza, Kalima Motlante, uh, Thabo Mbeki, Balek Ambete, from what I understand. And that is still in the pipeline. But, you know, they're going to try everything in their power. The youth vote is up for grabs, but I don't know if it is that they have the pull to make yes. sure that they do get it. Well, we'll have to see if any of this campaigning and posters and all of that translates into actual votes on the day, because that's ultimately the only thing that really matters. Every year, Time magazine celebrates 100 of the most influential people from around the world. Ranging from world leaders to artists and sporting heroes, this illustrious list is where legends of all kinds are honored. And this year, our very own Captain Fantastic, Sia Khaleesi, made the cut. Then, Limpopo is where it's at, as local musicians are making their mark on Spotify's regional charts. Let's get into our green shoots. Of course, we can't really go into green shoots without doing a quick shout out to Captain Fantastic, the Springbok darling, Sia Khaleesi. He was included in Time Magazine's Time 100 list for his leadership that really, let's be honest, not only brought home the Webb Ellis Cup, but it also united a nation at a time when we all felt pretty defeated with load shedding and all of that. I mean, what a legend. It's well deserved, hey? I don't Mm. think anyone can actually dispute it. And I think it gives the story of how South Africa has changed. I mean, there are a lot of issues, societal issues, socioeconomic issues, but there are success stories as well. Mm. And I think Sia Kolisi's story is one of those we cannot ignore. His upbringing and being able to pursue a sport that would ultimately change his entire life and the lives of those around him. I always look at how things played out during the Rugby World Cup, particularly how South Africa was definitely stressing us out (laughs) and how the box would go into a game and it would seem like they're losing and then at some point they would just come back so strong and I think it's really just a story of every kind of South African of how you can get into situations and you can live a life of adversity but at the end of the day you know you can fight. Mm, absolutely. And and I think that's something that a lot of people have taken from him as a person, as a leader, as a captain. And you can really sense just how inspirational he is across the board. And I have to kind of punt a, a DSTV series, of course. It's Chasing Please the do. Sun. Please. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's Chasing the Sun, the second season, which, I mean, when you watch the first season, I think we were all in tears. It is just so inspirational it just lifts your spirits you feel like you're part of something bigger there's this energy around the spring box and around Sia that permeates through society in a way that I don't think any of us can really explain so yeah definitely if you haven't watched Chasing the Sun go check it out it is on Showmax and you can also find it on Catch Up talking about being proudly South African and flying the flag high I want us to go to Limpopo you know where Spotify recently released data showcasing the evolving music landscape in the province. And it was very surprising because it showed that there's a clear rise in indigenous languages such as Sepedi, Tevenda and so forth, making up the majority of popular songs. Most notably, we have artists Pleasure Tsamanyalo and Maredi Maredi, who really made it big with about 46% of millennials tuning in for their songs. This just proves that local is indeed like And I think it also shows that South Africans are almost rediscovering the importance of supporting local and that we really have the talent out there. We don't have to turn to the UK or the US to get our fix of good music. Over the past couple of years, I think since maybe lockdown, South Africa has really come up with some beautiful music. 
exciting stuff that's become one of our biggest exports and achievements in the last couple of months. And when we look at Limpopo particularly, the province has done very well to come up with their own music genre and a fan base on its own. And you're right, it's music done in Chivenda, in Spedi. And when you talk about music from Limpopo, I think in the last couple of years, you can speak about Makadzi, who's a very huge uh, artist nationally and internationally as well. I think Mm. she's getting recognized. She's young, she's in her 20s, and she's really made a mark to the point where we've all had to sit up and acknowledge that there's this genre that's coming from Limpopo and it's kind of taking over. And despite the language barrier, we can acknowledge that it's good music. And we see even on TikTok how young uh, people are taking a huge interest in music from Limpopo, which is more on the very authentic, traditional South African style. Mm. And that goes back to saying South Africans We just need to appreciate what we have because it's quite special. I think we have discussed so much in today's show and it's really, it was a jam-packed episode. And as always, your insights are hugely appreciated. It really gives a lot of perspective on issues that are so big, especially on the ANC and the elections. So thank you again for joining us this week and I really look forward to our next chat. Thank you so much, Lazan. It's always good speaking to you and... Catch you next time. And that's a wrap. Join us again next week as we unpack more local and international headlines. Until then, give Carte Blanche and Daily Maverick a like and follow on socials.